God is worthy to be praised. We give all honor, glory, and praise to God our Father, Christ our Savior, Holy Spirit our Comforter. Yes, sir. We want to speak on his behalf to you, our Faith Artist family and friends. And we want to say to you, um, we love you and we miss you. Can't wait to see you. Now there is a word from the Lord today. I want to call your attention to Psalm number nine. Psalm number nine. I'm going to try to comb through verses 1 through 20. However, for your hearing, I'm only going to read verses 1 and 2. Psalm number 9, verses 1 and 2. And I will be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. From the New International Version of the Bible, Psalm number 9, verses 1 and 2, says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, mm -hmm. with all my heart. Yeah. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. I want to title our talk from Psalm number nine with this thought today. Make it right. Make it right. That's what we want to preach about. Make it right. Let me let me just drop this on you. Praise and worship is not wishful thinking. Praise and worship is grounded in the reality of God. Psalm number nine is written in crisis. And God knows we're in crisis times right now. In this acrostic and devotional psalm, not only is David hated, <clears throat> by his enemies, but in verse 13, the persecution he has suffered from them has been so extreme that they have pushed him to the gates of death. In other words, it's God do it or I'm dead. Now buried deep in every human heart is a longing for justice. There are things wrong and we need somebody to make it right. Who's going to make it right with COVID-19? Who's going to make it right with our economy? Who's going to make it right with our unemployment situation? Who's going to make it right with the personal and familial financial crisis that we're having right now. Who's gonna make it right with the effect that this pandemic is having on our businesses to the extent that many of them are shutting down, never to open again. 11 million people unemployed, highest number than ever, even during the Great Depression. That's what it stands at right now. So we need somebody to make it right. When you get lied on, you need somebody to make it right. When you're being assaulted and, and, and abused, you need somebody to make it right. When somebody's playing games on you and they're pigeon dropping you, you, you need somebody to make it right. You know that. 
And again, deep in our hearts, there's a longing for that. We long for a judge who will be fair and honest. <clears throat> we long for a judge who will see through the lies and the deceit to make things right. Ultimately, ultimately, this deep longing leads to the only living and true God. And here's why. Because he alone is the just ruler and the just judge of the universe. In fact, our longing for fairness and justice, our longing for someone to make it right is an echo of our deeper longing for God because we are made in his image and after his likeness. And so that's part of the character that we inherited from him. And so in, our, in his hour of great peril, look at what David does when he needs things to be made right. David turns to the Lord in prayer. But instead of rushing into God's presence with demands produced by panic, David begins his prayer with praise and worship to the Lord Most High. Now let me drop this on you. Don't fool yourself. God doesn't need our praise. Our praise doesn't do a thing for God. Our praise doesn't influence or impact God one way or the other. Well, why praise? Why praise God if it doesn't do a thing for him? When you praise people, it does something for them. It makes them smile. It makes them feel sort of, you know, good about whatever. But not God. So why do we praise God? Listen, praising God opens our eyes to see God for who he is. And that's why we praise him. We've been blind, we've been in the dark too long. We need to see God for who he is. And when we see God for who he is, we're going to see all of those false gods for who they really are. The big idea of this message is simply this. You should praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right. Praise God for being the one who makes things right. But what is required of you? to praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right. Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to try to go through our text. It has a great many um, answers to this question. Listen, to praise God for being the one who makes things right requires, first of all, a practice that is proper. A practice that is proper. Let, let me tell you this. Praise elevates and exalts the one being praised. And sometimes we get in panic mode because everything that we're up against is viewed by us as being bigger than the one who made us. Praise glorifies and magnifies the one being praised. David did not go to God in prayer elevating and exalting his enemies. He didn't go to God in prayer, elevating and exalting his needs. David did not go to God in prayer, elevating and exalting his problems. He didn't go to God in prayer, elevating and exalting his burdens or his valleys or his mountains. David did not go to God in prayer, glorifying and magnifying his obstacles and his opposition. As seen in verses 1 and 2 of this first complete praise song in the book of Psalms, total praise is engaging, exact, emotional, and expressive. In using the phrase with my whole heart, David is telling us that he engaged both his mind and his memory, his soul and his spirit in totally investing himself in giving thanks, worship, and praises from an undivided heart. He didn't hold back any part of himself. It was his all. 
David's thanks, worship, and praises were exact in that they were to the Lord most high. He wasn't just turning flips and cartwheels and saying thank you, thank you, thank you and left you wondering is he thanking God or Publisher's Clearinghouse? Is he thanking God or Louisiana State Lottery? No. No, he wanted us to know his praise was exact. It was to the Lord Most High. And saying, I will be glad and rejoice in you, and I will sing the praises of your name. David is informing us that his thanks, worship, and praises were emphatically emotional. Emphatically emotional. He wasn't trying to stay poised and contained. David got loose. Let me tell you. Wrap your mind around this. Praise is a rational retelling of historical reality. And in saying, I will tell of all your wonderful deeds, David is pointing out that his thanks, worship, and praises for God's miraculous, extraordinary, and direct interventions were expressive. I'm not going to just say thank you, Jesus, and I praise you, Lord, and I worship you, and I glorify you. I'm going to let folk know what I'm praising you for. I'm going to tell them what you did for me. Tell them how you brought me out. Tell them how you picked me up. Tell them how you opened doors for me, how you made my enemies behave. And tell them, point blank, expressively, this is what the Lord has done for me. Listen, we do not worship the works of God. We worship God the worker. Our joy in the Lord is incomplete until we can express it in praise. The praise of the Lord for being the one who makes things right not only requires a practice that is proper, second of all, it requires a profession that is proven, a profession that is proven. Now anybody can talk, anybody can claim this and that, and boy, when you go to church, there are a lot of folk who show up that just loves to be the center of attraction so they know how to put it on. So your mind gets off of what God is doing and get caught up in what they're doing. But I need to drop this on you. Praising God renews your faith. Praising God replenishes your power. Praising God reassures you of God's promises. And praising God restores your confidence. Having concentrated on God, and the greatness of God, David confirms in verses three through eight that he has the right perspective regarding the life-threatening conflicts and combatants that confront him. Got the right perspective. In verse six, in the New King James Version, look at what David acknowledges. He acknowledges that he is facing a formidable and conquering foe that had so destroyed uprooted cities that even their memories had perished. Having concentrated on God and the greatness of God, David is also able to contrast the temporal position and power of the enemy with the eternal presence and power of the Lord. So in verse 6 in the New King James Version, David says, O oh enemy, your destructions are finished forever. Or as stated in the New International Version, endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. Yeah, yeah, you, you had a long run at doing this, that, the other, the other folk rolling over them and running them over. But in God, you met your match. And it's over. Listen. I need to tell you this. God alone is the avenging warrior king judge to his enemies. The avenging warrior 
king judge to his enemies. God, the eternal judge, is the absolute righteous standard by which our lives are measured. God, the eternal judge, is the absolute righteous standard to which our lives are accountable. So don't pat yourself on the back thinking you all that because of who you stand yourself up beside. I'm not the measure of you and you're not the measure of me. God is the standard. And one day, let me tell you something, we all are gonna have the answer to the Lord. To praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right. Not only requires a practice that is proper and a profession that is proven, but third of all, it requires a perspective that is powerful. A perspective that is powerful. Listen, praising God revives your witness too and your well wishes for others. In verses 9 and 10, David's thoughts turn from his enemies to his friends. Man, there's no way you can worship God and praise God and be for real in what you're doing for God and then step out of that place of worship, that time of worship, and your mind is all wrapped up in you. If your worship is for real, the evidence will be you will want to bless somebody else. You will want to witness to somebody else. You will want others to enjoy from God what you're enjoying from God and even more. So in verses 9 and 10, David's thoughts turn from his enemies to his friends. Not only is God the avenging warrior king judge to his enemies, but verse 9 says, the Lord is a refuge. In other words, he's a secure fortress to the oppressed. And the Lord is a stronghold in times of trouble. In other words, he's protection for those who are in trouble. Verse 10 says, those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Those who know your name. I'm not just talking about those who know Elohim and El Ra and El Elyon and El Shaddai and El Rohi and Yahweh or Jehovah, Jireh, Sikinu and Shalom and, and the list goes on. No! That's not what this is about. Listen. God's people are those who have intimate communion with his name. So the question is not do you know his name, the question is how intimate are you with his name? How personal is his name to you? How involved are you and engaged are you? How hooked up are you with his name? God calls his people by name and he wants them to call him by name, intimately. To know God is to trust God. And to trust God is to feel secure with God. I don't know how you feel about it. I'm just as aware as you are of everything that's going on in the world, planet Earth, right here in our own country, in our own state. And yet, I'm safe and secure from all along because I'm leaning on the everlasting arm of the Lord. So we can talk about I, I trust him, I trust him, I trust him. But there's no way you can trust him as you should if you're not intimate with him as you should. It's dangerous to trust folk you don't know. No, 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 no. No. You see what happens when folk marry people they really didn't get to know? You see what happened to your money when you put it in the bank account with somebody else's name on it along with yours and you thought you knew them? You see what happened at work when you confided 
and your co-workers thinking you knew them and you found out they were your enemies rather than your friends? Oh, yeah. mm. Mm. <laughs> you, you, you see what kind of wreck your life is in? When you collected a seed from Sam? What? <laughs> and now Sam won't take care of son? Mm. You, do you see what's going on in your life when you dropped one on sister girl well. and 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 she had little one for you well. but since then it ain't been nothing but drama oh, my turned out it wasn't you she wanted she, she was happy to part with you, but she didn't want to part with the paycheck. Come on, Jack. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> our relationship with God, our relationship with God is secured because God does not forsake us. In other words, God does not leave us or abandon us. Check the text out. When we seek God, in other words, when we inquire of God, he is there and he answers. He said to us in Jeremiah 33 and 3, call me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things that you know not. And when Jesus, God the Son, showed up, he said to us in Matthew chapter 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it will be open to you. That's the kind of God we have. Now, to praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right not only requires a practice that is proper, a profession that is proven, and a perspective that is powerful. Fourth of all, it requires a proposal that is precious. A proposal that is precious. precious. Let me tell you something. Don't go crazy over everybody's offer to marry you. <laughs> all right, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't cartwheels because somebody said, let's make a deal. And you're thinking <laughs> it's a TV show <laughs> where you're fixing to win something. No, you're fixing to get walked on. <laughs> what we need is a proposal that is precious. Having meditated on the judgment of God and the mercy of God in saying, sing the praises of the Lord in verse 11. This is what David does. He calls God's people to worship the living God. And that's what we ought to be doing. Making an offer, making a proposal, extending an invitation to people not to do something where the sun don't shine. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but to Come on, worship. Come on, Jack. The living God. I see. Not to normalize this pandemic and go out like a person standing on a railroad track when a train is coming and blowing his horn and talking about, it can't touch me. It can't touch me. And they can't even have their funeral after have a memorial because no, there are no pieces of you left. I want to tell you this, beloved. Worship includes witness. Therefore, David calls upon God's people to proclaim among the nations, among the people, among the ethnos, what God has done. The Lord has done something for you. Tell it! David is saying, Make your folks in the Lord. Tell people God is the creator. Tell people he is the Lord. Tell people God is the sovereign ruler. Tell people there is no deceit in him. God cannot lie. 
He never promises and fails to deliver. God is not weak. He's not a wetback. God is the one who gives sight to the blind, feeds the hungry, raises the dead. He opened doors that have been closed in our faces. What has he done? He saved us from ourselves, saved us from our sins, saved us from our enemies. And so, we sing the praises of the Lord because as seen in verse 12, watch this now, the Lord is he who avenges blood. He's the one who makes it right. He's the one who settles the score. Vengeance belongs to him. God judges evil. God repays injustice. God executes the murderer. God defeats the enemy. God brings down nations and kings. We sing the praises of the Lord because as seen in verse 12, the Lord <laughs> does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. Yeah, that, that's why you better leave well enough alone. Don't, don't keep on pushing me. Don't Come keep on, Jack. at me. Come on, Jack. Take your play. Know, that the fact that there's still a smile on my face Come on, man. stop you. Let the fact that there are no you. tears in my eyes stop you. Right, but okay. if you break my heart, <laughs> if you Come on, man. cause tears to Come on, Jack. flood my eyes, let me tell you something. I may not pay you any attention, but God won't ignore you. The Lord is going to deal with you for messing with me. That's right. You better off putting a millstone around your neck and jumping into the depths of the sea than to offend yeah. the least of one of these God's children. So when you are afflicted, don't try to be, I'm just going to be strong. <laughs> that like big boys Come on, Jack. don't cry. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I got news for you. Grown men cry. Come on, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, even if it was for no other reason than somebody snatched you from them before they could put something on you. Mm. You know, they crying because they couldn't get their hands around your neck. Well. <laughs> I want you to understand. Well, I know something, Jack. The Lord does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. Therefore, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 says, The Lord mocks the mocker, but shows favor to the humble. And, and here's how the message says it. He gives proud skeptics a cold shoulder. But if you're down on your luck, he's right there to help. The praise of, to praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right, not only requires a practice that is proper, a profession that is proven, a perspective that is powerful, and a proposal that is precious, but fifth of all, it requires a purpose that is principled. A purpose that is principled. Now, there are some people who got no scruples. No scruples. Amen. They'll curse you out at the film. Mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> no scruples. No scruples. Amen. While the preacher's standing up preaching and you and they're supposed to be worshiping, they'll say something about your mama. <laughs> no scruples. No scruples. Come on, Jack. <laughs> and when they do something that supposedly seems good mm. for you, watch out. Because their good thing comes with an underhanded motive. That's right. Mm -hmm. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but listen. <laughs> listen. Scruples. That's not the way it is when we talk to God. Or at least that's not the way it should be. When we talk to God, our motives ought to be 
right. A good and honest and honorable motive should be the basis of our request to God. I say, Lord, do this for me. I shouldn't be asking him to do that so folk won't make fun of me. And so people will stop lying on me. And so people will start liking me. What's the matter with you? You too big for that. Grow up. While enduring great persecution from his enemies, in verse 13, look at what David does. David cries out, Lord, have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death. From the gates of death. Now watch this. Death in this passage is depicted as a walled city. And David is at its entrance. It is appropriate to cry out to Yahweh since ultimately only he can save David and us from death. And if you're in a habit of turning to the Lord only in a major crisis, this is what C.S. Lewis points out. He points out that God is so gracious that he will even take us when we use him as our last resort. <laughs> and I'm glad about that. <laughs> Amen. Because like you, I've had times in my past where I tried this and tried that, went here and went there, called on this one and called on that one and got let down and shut down and shut out and then got on my knees and said, and now, Lord, I ain't got nobody but you. Mm. And he's saying, I'm all you had in the first place. Yep. You should have come to me at first. The dying thief on the cross is a witness that God is so gracious that he will even take us when we use him as our last resort. He's up there dying and he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, yes, sir. remember me. And how many of y'all know Jesus took him even though Jesus was his last resort? He said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. David stated in verse 14, the reason he wanted the Lord to extend mercy to him. And look at what he said. He said, I'm crying and I'm asking you for mercy. Not so I won't be shamed. Not so I won't be embarrassed. Not so folk will stop laughing at me. Not so people will start liking me and stop lying on me and stop looking down on me but start looking up at me. No! He says, here's why I'm asking for your mercy in verse 14. That I may declare your praises in the gates of daughter Zion. Now here's what that means. That I may declare your praises publicly. I don't want to go up in a corner somewhere and shut the door in a closet and then just whisper my praise to God so nobody knows what I'm thankful for but me and him. No! I want to be able to get out amongst the folk in the public because they'll know I'm still here. I made it through! So have you. I've come through the fire and I've come through the flood. Kept by his power. Washed in his blood. And not only did I may declare your praises in the gates of daughter Zion, but there rejoice in your salvation. And so I want to publicly praise you and I want to publicly rejoice in your salvation. The point of God's mercy is not merely for our own self-satisfaction. It is for his glory expressed by our worship. When God delivers us from our enemies, he also delivers us from ourselves that we may be free to publicly praise and rejoice in him as a witness to his love and as a witness to his power. Huh. To praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right. Not only requires a practice that is proper, a profession that is proven, a perspective that is powerful, a proposal that is precious, and a purpose that is principled, but sixth of all, it requires a providence 
that is prevailing. Psalm number 7 verse 15 says this. Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. The old church said it this way. If you dig one ditch, you better dig two. Because the first one you did just made it for you. And in Psalm number 9, verse 16, this is what it says. The wicked are ensnared by the works of their hands. In verse 15, the nations are pictured as hunters who have set traps for David. But they themselves have fallen into the very pit that they have dug for David and for Israel. What am I saying? I'm saying don't waste your time harboring fugitives from justice such as anger and resentment and bitterness and vindictiveness. Let that stuff go. You just go on living. You just go on smiling. You just go on keeping your head lifted to the heels from whence cometh your help. You just keep on waiting on the Lord. God's got your back. And he is the one who will make your enemies behave. He is the one who will prepare a table before you in the very presence of your enemies. And for whatever it is they have done or plotted and planned to do to you, God is the one who will make it right. If we rightly see God's response to oppression, segregation, the exploitation of the poor, just to name a few things, as pointed out in verse 16, it is clear that the Lord is known by his acts of justice. He is a just God, and he'll make it right. Now, finally, I need to say this to you. So praise the Lord for being the one who makes things right requires a prediction that is predetermined. It is imperative that we keep in mind the outcome of those who forget God and those whom God will never forget. Consistent with verse 17, Psalm number one, verse six says, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The living God is and always has been present and active in history and in human life. In saying in Psalm number 9 verse 19, Arise, Lord, let the nations be judged in your presence. David is asking God, the avenging warrior king judge, to enter into battle and overcome the wicked. Now, I want to have you to know today, don't worry about the wicked. <laughs> David says in Psalm yeah, number 37, I believe it is, fret not thyself. Because of evil doers. Neither be thy enemies against the wicked. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Don't go stare crazy over the wicked. One of these days, the wicked shall cease from trouble. And the weary shall be at rest. And knowing that God will move upon us or upon our enemies in his perfect timing. David prays in verse 20, strike them with terror, Lord. But verse 18 says, but God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. Isn't that good news? Jesus is the hope of the afflicted. And he will never perish. And if you put your trust in him, you don't have to worry about throwing in the towel. It may take a while by your time, but in God's perfect timing, it'll be all right. 
And so David said, wait on the Lord and be of a good courage. Well, uh, I'm going to leave you alone now. I just want to tell you, David's hope and our hope is fulfilled in Christ. Psalm number nine is also an eschatological psalm. It's an eschatological psalm because it convinces us that because of God and the judgment of God, God's mercy, yeah, yeah, is available to us. Mount Sinai becomes Mount Calvary when we know the heart of God. You couldn't get close to Mount Sinai. You couldn't touch Mount Sinai without dropping dead, without almost having a heart attack because God so mightily manifested his presence. But whereas we could not draw near to Mount Sinai, yeah, we could make a trip to Calvary. And to make a trip to Calvary, you don't have to get on a plane uh, and fly to the Holy Land. All you got to do uh, is open your Bible uh, and read God's Word. And you'll find out uh, that one Friday they hung him high and stretched him wide. One Friday, Jesus uh, made it right. He made it right between God and man. Man had sinned against God, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus made it right. The Bible says that it pleased God to bruise him, so he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed he made it right he died didn't he die but he didn't stay dead three days later he rose again. Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? Ain't God all right? I know he's all right. I know he's all right. I know he's all right. Make it all right. Just a little talk with Jesus. He'll make it all right. Talk with him. He'll raise up a bow down head. Talk with him. He'll wipe the tears from your eyes. Talk with him. He'll heal your body. Talk with him. He'll put strength in your legs. Talk with him. He'll soothe your pain. Talk with him. He'll calm you down. Talk with him. He'll make bad children good. Talk with him. He'll make wayward husbands come home. Talk with him. He'll make loose women straighten up. And bad wives and the good wives. Talk with him. He'll make it right. He'll take that taste out of your mouth for drugs and liquor. Talk with him. I tell you he'll fix it. Anybody know that he will? I said he will. Jesus, he'll fix it. He'll fix it. forgiven, he'll make that right. If you need your soul saved, he'll make it right. You don't have to die and go to hell. 
And you don't have to live life all alone and lost. You don't have to go through life with so-called friends or choosing to have no friends at all because you've been wounded too severely. Oh, what a friend Come on, Jack. we have in Jesus. And if you want to accept his offer of salvation and, and, and kinship and friendship, just repeat after me, Lord, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead on the third day according to scripture and on the strength and promise of your word and your character, I'm saved and I thank you for that. If you've done that, I want you to know, if you've done that genuinely and sincerely, it doesn't matter that nothing hit you from the crown of your head and went down to the sole of your feet. It's not about that. It's not about your feelings. It's about the fact of God's word. And on the fact of his word, you've just been born again. Welcome to the family of God. And if you've already been born again, but you've strayed, you, you've just dropped out, it's time to come home. It's time to come back. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never shut you out. This is your moment. If you make that decision, I'd love to hear from you at jbcks9772 at gmail.com. Something that I think will sum up 